I am Dr. Nashley Cephas, and I am founder and CEO of The Bean Path. I'm an expert in artificial intelligence, and I noticed, um, having been born and raised here in Jackson, Mississippi, that I still notice a lot of gaps as far as technology amongst our communities. I love being able to come back and show people, one, what is artificial intelligence, two, show them how they're kind of already using it, whether they know it or not, and three, showing them all the benefits of it, as well as things to be concerned about. Today is one of our tech office hours that we have usually every second Saturday at a local library in Jackson, Mississippi. So the tech office hours are completely free. We've been able to offer those coding classes where some youth come in to learn how to make beats, for instance, or older individuals who are wanting to do something different, they had the opportunity to learn how to create a website. Today we will be learning how to use a video editing software with AI uh, taught by Dr. Nashley Cephas. And basically this is gonna take a very intimidating uh, task such as video editing and make it a lot easier and more accessible for everyone. The Bean Path has really impacted our local community and that we can take in people who sign up for our office hours, show them how to use their technology in a way that's more efficient to them. Um, sometimes they feel intimidated and we show them that it's very easy to use everything and we're here to show them how. I've been coming to the Bean Path since I've attended the Coding Academy when Nashley Cephas first came around. To be honest, this is very inspiring. That I look up to her a lot. So to see her out here, and uh, especially down the street from where I live, to be at the library and teaching this type of technology and stuff, especially when I grew up around technology, is, is very exciting. Uh, Dr. Nashley Cephas has worked tirelessly to expand the reach of technology in Mississippi, and this has directly impacted the people who live here, the economy. It has encouraged others to get involved in the tech community and to otherwise seek tech careers when they may have not thought that they could do it before. We've hosted coding classes and also one teaching individuals who aren't in school, who haven't been in school in a while, those specific skills. I hope that people come to the Bean Path Tech Office Hours and walk away with a newfound love or passion for technology and knowing how they can use it in their everyday lives, basically to make their lives a lot easier. I am Dr. Nashley Holly Cephas, CEO and founder of The Bean Path. Last year we helped over 250 people, gave away over $8,000 in grants and scholarships, and we'd love to help you cultivate to sprout so you can determine your route. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Hey, everybody out there, thank you for joining. Uh, I'm excited to be here uh, to share this time with you all to talk about AI and drawing. And so uh, in case you are just joining and didn't see the video, um, this is the Bean Path. And we do free tech office hours for people who need help with technology, whether it be with your computer, you need help with your startup company or uh, more advanced work like how to code or just mentoring for kids. And so uh, we love doing this type of work. We have a whole team and staff uh, based in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, but as you know, now we're virtual uh, because of that, that Rona out there. And, and so we want to make sure that people have access to this type of content. We're also recording. So if you do miss some parts, don't worry. You can always replay it um, once we post it on our website and from our social media. So wonderful. Thank you so much again for joining. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen so we can get right to it. Okay. All right, so as I mentioned today, we're gonna to be talking about AI and drawing. Uh, we have uh, several different applications of artificial intelligence in today's world. Um, you'd be surprised some people are using it and they don't even know that they're using it, but um, artificial intelligence, the way I like to describe it is uh, the use of algorithms or technology that looks at lots and lots of data and tries to find patterns in that data. And so once we have found patterns in that data, we can now go out into the wild and say, okay, this looks like something that I knew 
when um when I learned patterns from previous data that I've seen before. And so this works in terms of anything such as uh, in terms of recognizing someone's face or recognizing objects in an image. Um, I know that this is a cat or this is a dog because I've seen lots of pictures of cats or lots of pictures of dogs. The same way that the algorithm, uh, it takes all this data and it tries to learn all these patterns. Um, and we also call this field machine learning or deep learning um, or computer vision. And so uh, that's just one subset of it. There also, it also can be applied to things like speech recognition. And if you use products like you know, Siri or Google or Alexa, um, and they can recognize your voice. It's because these devices or these algorithms and these devices have uh, studied many, many patterns of people saying hello, people saying goodbye. And they now can recognize other people saying hello and goodbye. So they can almost like have a natural conversation with you. And so uh, today we're gonna delve into how is AI and can it be used in terms of drawing? And don't worry, you don't have to have a PhD in, in rocket science um, to understand today's talk, uh, but we do want to break it down and make it where you can easily see how this works. And so what we're gonna be using today is a tool called Quick Draw. So Quick Draw was created by Google. Um, it is free and anyone can use it. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna exit out of my presentation and I'm gonna go over to a short video and it's gonna explain a little bit about Quick Draw and then we'll delve into actually using it ourselves. So let's watch this quick video, here we go. Jonas, hi, I'm Henry. Quick Draw is a game a few of us at Google made and the computer uses machine learning to guess what you're drawing. I see square, or suitcase, or canoe. Oh, I know, it's shoe. It's an experiment that uses some of the same technologies that helps Google translate, recognize your handwriting. To understand handwriting or drawings, you don't just look at what the person drew, you look at how they actually drew it. Which strokes did they make first? Which direction did they draw them in? You train the computer on millions of characters from hundreds of languages. And over time, it learns whether you wrote book or whether you wrote book. Training is a big part of how the computer can guess your drawings correctly. As babies, it's easy for us to look at these three drawings and know they're all cats. But to a computer, they're very different. One is just a head, one has a full body, and one is just facial features. To get the computer to understand, you have to show it a lot of cat doodles. Then it starts to see patterns, like that almost all doodles of cats have pointy ears, a small nose, and whiskers doesn't always work. That's because it's only seen a few thousand doodles. But the more you play with it, the more it will learn, and the better it will get at guessing. Oh, I know. It's cat. We put it on the web for anyone to play with. We hope it inspires other people to think about fun ways to use machine learning. You can play it at g.co slash AI experiments. Okay. So hopefully that gave you some uh, example or some idea of uh, how this tool works. And so uh, it was created by Google. And so there's an organization called uh, uh, AI for All, which we were definitely grateful for them for putting out this content. Uh, just really, really quickly, AI for All is the name of an organization that tries to make uh, artificial intelligence learning uh, accessible to uh, underrepresented groups. And so if you feel free to check out their website, um, ai-4-all.org, and they have uh, more information there and several things that they do for uh, various people all across the country. Um, and then they have specific curricula uh, for you to use if you're a teacher or if you're just a tutor or if you're just wanting to learn yourself. Um, they have so many uh, freely available uh, lessons out there to help you understand, which is where exactly where we got the AI and drawing slides and uh, content for today. So we want to thank them for providing that. And let's get back to what we're doing. All right, so let's try quick draw. So if you're at home and you're using your computer, or your tablet, um, feel free to uh, you know put me on another tab and try to open up this quick draw 
www.withgoogle.com. And this is a part of the AI experiments that Google creates to help provide more access to people to understand these topics. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Quick Draw and AI, another, another tool that is used in AI is called a neural network. And it's basically the name of the algorithm that we use to create these things. So let's try Quick Draw. So we're gonna have, it's gonna have us drawing various things. So let's see, I know my handwriting is not the best, but let's try it. All right, so it's gonna have us draw six drawings. All right, the first one says, draw a clock in under 20 seconds. So here we go. I'm gonna to try to draw it. And it's I see knee or it. nose or moon or circle. I see potato or cookie. Oh, I know, it's clock. All right. Hey, so it guessed that I was drawing a clock. Um, and so this is the artificial intelligence, the AI. Um, is studying my strokes, is studying uh, the direction that I'm drawing, what I'm drawing, the lines, the dots, and it's saying, hey, this must be a clock based on all the other patterns that I've studied from other people who have tried to draw something similar. All right, so let's try it again. Hopefully you're getting uh, some good ones there as well. So let's try to draw a mushroom next. I see line or shrimp or knee, or watermelon, or shoe. I see pond. Oh, I know, it's mushroom. Yep, so that was pretty simple. Uh, now let's try this one. It says, let's draw an ear. Um, and by the way, let's try to trick it, right? So if you're saying, hey, it knows what you're trying to draw, so why don't it just say what you're trying to draw? If you notice that as I'm drawing, it's actually trying to tell me what it thinks I'm drawing before I actually finish drawing it. And it's, it's studying all the things. So even before when I was drawing the clock and I had a circle, it said, hey, circle. Yeah, but I wasn't done drawing yet. But it knows that from the first time I drew the, the first item that that is a circle. So let's try to trick it and see if it guesses something if I intentionally try to draw something different. So for example, if I try to draw the sun instead of the ear, let's see what happens. I see moon or circle. I see blueberry, I see pear, or apple, or sun. All right, you see it guessed the I'm sun. I'm not sure what that is. It did guess the sun, now it's not sure because of course my writing is not the best. I'm not sure what that is, sorry, I couldn't guess it. So it actually did guess it, it was the sun, but notice that it wasn't automatically saying it was an ear or whatever it says here in the in the wording. And so you know that something is definitely going on. It's not just, you know, simply repeating whatever it is that it's asking you to draw. Um, so let's try it again. Let's try uh, to draw something that I know. So for example, it's saying to draw a well. I'm gonna try to draw a, a drum, for example. Let's see what happens. I see shoe or knee or pond or watermelon. I see potato or hockey puck. I see hot tub or cake or bottle cap or birthday cake. I see pool or chandelier or drums or alarm there clock. There we go. So it, it got that I was trying to do the drums. Now you notice. Sorry, I couldn't guess it. That's okay. Don't worry, Google. All right. So you notice that as I was drawing other things, it was also trying to guess, okay, potato. Even after I told, uh, even after it guessed that it was a drum, it was still trying to guess more things because um, what the algorithm is saying is that, hey, based on what you're doing and what you're drawing, it can be a drum, but it can also be these other things. And so it has a certain, what we call our confidence score that says, let's try to return back everything we think it is with a very high confidence. So it thought with a very high confidence that I was drawing a potato or uh, you know, some other object other than a drum. And it was actually based off what it has learned in the past. All right, so let's try to uh, finish these last two out. So I'm gonna try to draw a chair. I see watermelon or shoe. I see toilet. Toilet. Oh, I know, it's chair. Yep, so we got that one. All right, and let's do the last one, tiger. I see ocean or squiggle or bat or mustache or animal migration. I see teapot or mosquito or anvil or teddy bear. I see bear or monkey. <laughs> I have no clue what you're drawing. I see dog. 
Sorry, I couldn't guess it. <laughs> All right, so I have definitely have trouble drawing a tiger with my uh, index finger on the mouse pad, but um, you can kind of get an idea of how well the neural network or the AI model did. Um, it was able to figure out three of the things that I was drawing. And of course we know these two, I intentionally tried to not draw <clears throat> correctly, but if we look, delve a little bit closer. So I was asked to draw an ear. I actually drew uh, the sun. Um, you can see it did actually guess the sun and it has the closest match. And so that means was, the algorithm was very confident that I was trying to draw a sun. Now it also has other confidence scores such as the next highest was the snowflake. Um, and then the next highest was a satellite. So it's pretty interesting looking satellite there. All right, and so um, there's also examples of what it can show. So for example, it shows what other people have drawn. Um, so if I were actually drawing an ear, I can compare it to how other people have actually drawn the ear as well. Um, and so you can see that it's learning that, hey, an ear probably has this curved uh, C-like shape and it has some you know, lines, squiggly lines in between. And that's pretty consistent. So that's a pattern that the algorithm is finding in all these examples of people drawing ears. So now when it tries to guess my drawing, it's gonna be looking for something similar. And so this is kind of how AI works. Uh, let's go back to our uh, slide and talk a little bit more about what it is exactly that's going on in the, in the background. All right, so Google has built a model that can tell people you know, what it is that they're drawing based on their pen strokes. So you can imagine that even the way you're drawing like the, from left to right or from top to bottom, it's also studying that too. And every time that someone plays this game, the model learns from it. And so hopefully I didn't mess it up too much by trying to draw a sun instead of an ear, but it's learning every time. This is what we call machine learning. Uh, which is another word for, uh, or a tool that we use in AI. So this model has learned from a lot of people. I think there's over, uh, there are hundreds of millions of people uh, that uh, different drawings that have been drawn in this particular game, I think at about 15 million. And so the model has a lot of data to learn from. When we're training models with artificial intelligence, for example, for things like face recognition or for things like uh, speech recognition, they're using millions and millions of pieces of data in order to understand these patterns in order to get it as robust and as accurate as possible. So as I mentioned, this branch uh, is called machine learning. If you want to go even deeper, if you're talking about visual aspects, that's called computer vision or deep learning. And so all of those fall in the, under the umbrella of artificial intelligence or AI. And of course, um, these applications are not just limited to, you know, cell phone devices. They also considered, uh, you know, in terms of self-driving cars. So if you wonder how does a car know, um, you know, these self-driving cars are a lot closer than we think um, in today's world. And how does a car know that this is the lane versus that lane? How does it know that a car is coming on oncoming traffic um, head on and to avoid these type of collisions? Um, how do we know that people are crossing the street or that there's a red light so that the car should stop? Again, someone has taken lots of pictures and lots of video of uh, cars driving, lots of pictures of red lights, lots of pictures of people crossing back and forth um, across the street. And the algorithm for the self-driving cars is learning all of this so they can understand uh, you know, what to do in the event that various events are happening um, outside of the car. Um, and lastly, the same type of thing happens in terms of recommendations for, for example, YouTube or Netflix. Um, it, that field is also called personalization. And that what that does is it says, it follows the patterns. If you say you like this movie or you like that movie, it's collecting all this data about you and it's understanding and trying to predict what you may like uh, in the future or what to recommend to you. Sometimes it's right and sometimes it's not, but the idea is that that's what it's attempting to do. So again, everything revolves around data. Data is very important when it comes to machine learning or um, you know, algorithms. And so let's have a quick discussion. So when we look at the drawings, so let's take a step back and let's go back to our, uh, our drawings here. 
So as I mentioned, if we go back to the data for quick draw. And if we go to the actual data set, so let's look at the, the drawings here. Now, what we notice, like I mentioned, there are 50 million drawings. Uh, uh, I said hundreds, but it's actually 50 million drawings. Um, and these are created by 15 million different players that have played this game. And so these people are actually from uh, different parts of the world. They're from the United States, from, from the UK, they're from all over. And what it does is it tracks that information from the user as they're playing the game. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but you can also look and actually view at all the different types of things that have been drawn by people. So let's take a look at the, let's see, we could find something that that we like here. All right, so let's take a look at the grapes. All right, so we have, they have 143,320 drawings of grapes. Wow, that is a lot of grapes out there in the world. And so if you look, you can see a lot of similarities. I guess when people think of grapes, they think of circles being attached to each other. Um, we could look a little bit more closely to one of them. For example, if we click on this one, it says, again, it tells you where the drawing came from. It says it was drawn in Croatia um, on March 26th of 2017. So this tool was released back in 2016. And so you have essentially uh, years and years of data that have been collected here. Um, now you can look at something else that may look a little bit less like uh, grapes. So either this person doesn't know how to draw that well, or maybe grapes really do look this way in Georgia. Georgia, now this is the country, Georgia, not the state. And so uh, you can imagine that people have different um, ideas of what grapes may look like. I mean, I think grapes look pretty standard, but let's try something else. For example, let's go down to the shoe example. So if we click on shoe. So we got 115,749 shoes in this data set. We call it a data set. And so uh, a lot of the shoes look pretty similar. Like you see some similar patterns like L shapes. Uh, we got a, oh, we got a heel over there. Got a, some, some boots. Uh, we got some high heels down there. Let's see, where's this from? Uh, this is from Russia, uh, Russian Federation on January 27, 2017. Uh, let's see what this, this one looks more like a sneaker. Looks like this one was drawn in Germany. And notice that it has this flag is inappropriate. Um, that's a big thing too. And we're doing what we call uh, this crowdsourcing of data. That means collecting data from general people in the public. Um, sometimes, you know, you get some things that you wouldn't expect and you can always flag it as inappropriate. Like for example, if, I, if this looked nothing like a shoe and for example, my, my picture of the sun that I was drawing instead of the ear, then I could go back and flag my drawing as inappropriate or someone else can because that's going to affect the uh, data and the outcome of the algorithm. It's very important to have uh, good quality data in our algorithms for artificial intelligence because it's almost like uh, I always say using a calculator. Um, just because you use the calculator doesn't guarantee that you'll get the right answer, right? Garbage in, garbage out. So it's really important when we're having data uh, for artificial intelligence algorithms to have good data in, good data out. So when you say good data, that means sound quality data that has a variety of data from a very diverse set of people. We also want to make sure that the data is annotated and actually cleaned. For example, we're looking through to ensure that it is actually what it says it is before we actually use it in our models. And so this is how uh, all of this works. Okay, so we talked about some of the features that are coming across the various pictures. Uh, we also talked about uh, features that, uh, you know, it didn't seem to learn. Like, for example, uh, we may have issues with, uh, you didn't see a lot of high heels uh, in the pictures. A lot of the shoes were flat. So what if uh, there's not a good representation of high heel shoes in those uh, pictures of shoes? So we want to make sure that those group of shoes are um, included. So when we look at the data, uh, we have what we call this metadata or these attributes that are collected 
every time we collect another piece of data. And this is for any uh, machine learning algorithm. Um, so we have some unique identifier. This just makes sure that we know that we can identify this with some, usually some number or some letter that says, okay, every time I pull up this particular image, it's always gonna be this image. Uh, we also wanna make sure we save information like what is the word that was used um, that they were supposed to draw. Um, and then if it was recognized or not, it's, you know, it's true or false, but we're able to guess it. Uh, and then we wanna look at, okay, when was it drawn? So you saw that I had time information such as 2017 or 2018. Um, we also have the country that the person is from and they collect all the different types of strokes that the person used to make that image. Now, this data set is publicly available. Um, and you see the um, link below and people can use this data for different things. And so you might wonder, okay, what in the world would you be able to use this data, data for? Well, we can learn a lot from the data. For example, uh, we can understand how do people draw. Maybe if we understand how people draw, we can more easily um, help people learn how to draw in the future. Um, and then also, um, you know, I mentioned that this country data is being collected. Now, you may say, hey, wait a minute, I didn't want any of my data to be collected. Um, and these are real concerns that exist in today's world in terms of data and sharing data and data privacy. Um, there's many uh, conversations and controversies going on around what is a okay use of data or not. Um, for example, uh, it didn't really indicate to us that it was saving our country data. Um, and so we just assumed that, you know, by using it, you know, it's not really saving anything, but it actually was. Um, and this can cause some concerns. And so maybe there could have been, you know, a little alert to say, hey, just let you know, we're gonna save your data. If you agree, a lot of times when we hit, I agree in the apps, um, we're saying, hey, it's okay to use my data. It's okay to use certain things about my data. Um, we also want to know uh, if the data is going to be uh, associated with me in any way. So you can imagine, like, obviously, there are some pictures, you know, there are pictures of you out there or even pictures of your face. You may not want to want to be uh, tied to that in, in any particular way. And so, again, these are our privacy issues that are ongoing about how do we enforce laws to say, okay, you know, my data is private, you can't use it. Um, and there's also more concerns in terms of things like, for example, face recognition, um, security applications, uh, even using my voice and being able to say, hey, I don't want to, I don't want uh, people being able to play back some of the conversations that I've had, you know, is my phone listening to me? These are real concerns. And so this is a part of uh, some of the issues around uh, artificial intelligence. All right, so we talked about different ways that uh, this data can be used. So for example, this is a, again, it's a publicly available data set. And you can think about, you know, there is something called, uh, there's a website called Misfire that actually took this very same data and says, hey, um, let's see if we can uh, guess what, what these people are trying to draw. And this is another way to kind of get user collected data, like in terms of understanding if the data is, uh, it is what it says it is, we can use crowdsourcing, like I mentioned earlier. So basically using the public to understand uh, if this is what it says it is or not. Now, I'll try to guess a few of these. I guess this is a uh, boomerang. I don't know. Let's see. Okay, this, the word was pliers. So, so all of these are the drawings, by the way, that the Google Quick Draw uh, was not able to correctly um, guess. And so they're trying to see if we can actually correctly guess because they actually do know what it is. So I was not able to guess that. All right, let's try a couple more. Um, any ideas out there? I'm gonna say guitar. Oh, close. Sorry, it says it was understand. a cello. All right, let's try one more. Oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to say monster. Oh, it was a hot dog. That would have been my next guess. All right, so this is a way that you can get correctly labeled um, information uh, or just try to understand more about what do people really think 
you know, and should we change the way that our model operates? Now, another application is, uh, this is another uh, type of experiment that Google can use. For example, um, they can collect this uh, data with uh, not just drawings, for example, we can collect this data with uh, writing applications. So um, there are AI algorithms that can automatically create um, drawings for a story. Um, there are AI algorithms that can automatically create the story, um, for example. Um, we can help people learn how to draw, as I mentioned. And so these are several experiments. You can go to experiments.withgoogle.com to find out more information. Uh, one of my favorites, and we may actually do a follow-up on this, but uh, there's the semiconductor, which you can actually um, act as if you're conducting an orchestra, and it's reading your, um, your, your uh, gestures and your arm movements in order to help you understand like if I raise my hands like this the orchestra plays louder if I move my hands closer to my chest the orchestra, orchestra plays a lot softer if I turn to the right it can, I can direct the um you know the cellos if I turn to the left I can direct the violins and the other smaller wind instruments and so uh you know lots of lots of applications here so I definitely recommend you you check those out um the last application I think if I could pull it up here uh, so this is actually a uh, camera that you can uh, take a picture of something and it instantly draws a cartoon of uh, whatever it is that you're taking a picture of. So this is an example of a guy who's taking a picture of a bicycle um, in a field and it is actually printing out a cartoon version of the bicycle. So um, lots and lots of, of ways you can use this since these are open, uh, openly available data set. Um, you really don't have to worry about any permissions or licensing or things like that. And so I encourage you to play around with it, especially if you're interested in um, drawing and AI and so forth. So I think, um, you know, we can definitely take a look here and there's a lot you can do with it. All right, so wrapping up and then I wanna make sure that we have some time uh, for questions as well. So. There are various things that you can do uh, with, uh, like I mentioned, the auto, there's the auto draw, there's the instant cartoons application. Um, what I do wanna touch on really quickly is the idea of algorithmic bias. And so, as I mentioned, for example, uh, the, the definition of bias is uh, prejudice in favor or of or against one thing, person or group compared with another, usually in a way considered to be be unfair. Um, now, algorithmic bias, it, it basically means automated decision making that reflects uh, existing societal biases, often because the data that the decision was based on reflected those biases. And so we see this a lot in today's world in terms of, uh, you know, any type of AI that involves a human. So that can include, like I mentioned, the face recognition, the voice recognition, um, and these things uh, can occur of the data. You think about the drawings, uh, when we had the drawings of, hold on one second, the drawings of the shoes, for example. And let's take uh, the drawings of the shoes. Some of the shoes, shoe drawings had high heels, some of them didn't. Um, here's another example of, for example, bad drawings. So some people tried to draw these flamingos, uh, which I don't think those are, he, flamingos, but hey, who maybe to somebody it looks like flamingos. Um, but remember, if people, if you're only asking a certain number of people or a certain group of people from a certain region, um, especially with the shoe example, um, you're seeing maybe shoes without high heels. Maybe you're seeing a lot more uh, men drawing these, these shoes. And so you don't see a lot of sandals or high heels or vice versa. And so that's what we call um, biases that can exist in the data. And so that is very important. Remember garbage in, garbage out. If the humans are biased, then the data that they create and put into the algorithms are biased too. That's why it's very important for the technologist or the person creating the algorithm to make sure that they're sourcing data from a wide variety of people. So I have one more video to show that kind of explains the biases a little bit more to give you some example of uh, things to be mindful of.
shopping. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. Okay, did anyone picture this? This? How about this? We may not even know why, but each of us is biased toward one shoe over the others. Now imagine that you're trying to teach a computer to recognize a shoe. You may end up exposing it to your own bias. That's how bias happens in machine learning. But first, what is machine learning? Well, it's used in a lot of technology we use today. Machine learning helps us get from place to place, gives us suggestions, translates stuff, even understands what you say to it. How does it work? With traditional programming, people hand code the solution to a problem step by step. With machine learning, computers learn the solution by finding patterns in data. So it's easy to think there's no human bias in that. But just because something is based on data doesn't automatically make it neutral. Even with good intentions, it's impossible to separate ourselves from our own human biases. So our human biases become part of the technology we create in many different ways. There's interaction bias, like this recent game where people were asked to draw shoes for the computer. Most people drew ones like this. So as more people interacted with the game, the computer didn't even recognize these. Latent bias. For example, if you were training a computer on what a physicist looks like, and you're using pictures of past physicists, your algorithm will end up with a latent bias, skewing towards men. And selection bias. Say you're training a model to recognize faces. Whether you grab images from the internet or your own photo library, are you making sure to select photos that represent everyone? Since some of our most advanced products use machine learning, we've been working to prevent that technology from perpetuating negative human bias. From tackling offensive or clearly misleading information from appearing at the top of your search results page, to adding a feedback tool on the search bar so people can flag hateful or inappropriate autocomplete suggestions. It's a complex issue and there's no magic bullet, but it starts with all of us being aware of it so we can all be part of the conversation because technology should work for everyone. All right, so hopefully that gave you a little bit more, uh, a better idea about um, you know, different types of biases that can exist. And just because we're using technology, remember, just because we use a calculator in math class doesn't guarantee the right answer. Uh, we want to make sure that we're being just as fair um, when we're considering our algorithms, um, you know, and so forth. Now, getting back to the quote unquote, the art application that we're applying, if one uses data in the correct way and they're fair about their data and they're trying to be as unbiased as possible. Um, there's some amazing things you can do with this technology. Um, for example, with the art example, all of these examples you can take and uh, for example, a robot arm uh, was able to paint these pictures here at the top. Um, and all this is based off of the previous data and the training uh, with the algorithm. Now you can also look at these drawings down here. And remember I mentioned that uh, artificial intelligence, there are uh, applications out there where you can automatically create pictures for a story. Um, so this is what you're seeing here. And also you're seeing uh, what we call, uh, so technology we call GANS, uh, G-A-N-S, General Adversarial Networks. You can actually merge paintings and merge pictures into one. So for example, you're seeing a combination of the Starry Night, uh, which is a Van Gogh painting, uh, combined with, of course, the Mona Lisa. Um, you get some pretty interesting, uh, it's almost like a filter, but it's a little bit different because we're using previous data, whereas a filter is just applying something directly without any previous information. And so uh, you're, you're getting some pretty interesting looking artwork here. And so again, I just encourage you all to look more into it. Uh, I do again want to thank AI for All for their uh, curriculum here. And I think at this time, uh, if we have any questions, I'd be happy to take questions, questions about um, artificial intelligence, questions about biases in data, uh, or just any general questions about, you know, my, my work and what I do, uh, or uh, the Bean Path. So definitely happy to, to do that. So I'll switch it off of my screen. And okay.
Hello, Nashley, and hello, our viewers. This is Teresa Kennedy, and I am with the Bean Pass. Uh, one question that we have is, there are many studies that show machines and algorithms that can be biased. How can we ensure that AI is inclusive? Right, so there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, like I say, AI is all around us, uh, whether we, we know it or not. Um, it's in your pocket, it's on your cell phone. Um, how can we make sure it's inclusive? Well, there's the obvious uh, reason, which is, you know, trying to ensure that we have people from uh, various backgrounds and various, um, you know, uh, walks of life, various age groups, uh, various ethnicities. Um, we're talking about computer vision. Uh, we want to make sure we have a, a varying number of different types of skin tones that we're training and testing our algorithms on. And so all these are ways that we can be more inclusive. Now, one may say, okay, uh, you know, it's very difficult to hire diverse teams. Um, it's actually not as difficult as you think if you're looking in the right place. Um, however, uh, even if you don't have those people on your team, so I'm talking about the technologists, the software developers out there, the big corporations um, that create this technology, as well as the smaller companies and startups, um, definitely make sure that you're putting together focus groups um, to understand, you know, your customer base. It's really just the same as basic business practices, right? You want to make sure when you're starting a business, you're doing some sort of customer discovery, you're doing some, um, you know, some surveys of different people out there. You may send out a survey or you may interview people in person. Um, it really just depends. And so uh, you just want to make sure you're collecting as much information and testing on, on a wide variety of people and making sure that you invite those people to the table so they can give you input and help you understand. Uh, like for example, you see my, my video actually is going uh, in and out and I often say, you know, was this type of technology tested on people with darker skin, skin tones? And so hopefully, uh, you know, I know I have some backlight here, so that also contributes to it. So you just wanna be able to create products that work for a wide variety of people, especially um, you know, various types of people in your customer base, so. Okay, thank you. So we have a lot of questions in the Q&A. One example of how a and I we can encounter daily. I guess they're asking, give one example how we encounter AI daily. I know you mentioned the phone, um, but help them, I guess, understand like if they're walking through a park or if they're going into a grocery store. Um, how do they encounter technology? Right. So good good question. Um, there's a New York Times article um, that says that over 50% of our, our, uh, our faces, or 50% of people who live in the United States, uh, your face is already included in a face database uh, somewhere, you know, being used for something, whether you agree to it or not. Um, and so there are public applications where you know, up until a certain point, or up until recently, there really haven't been any, uh, you know, laws or privacy protection on uh, certain types of data that are freely, you know, you can put a camera up in, in, the, in the public park, like you mentioned, and, and uh, there's really nothing to stop you from doing that. And so, you know, of course, these are concerns, but just in general, uh, I mentioned the face, the uh, face recognition, like when you're unlocking your phone, for example, um, if you use that feature, um, when you set up that feature, it asks you, okay, take a few pictures of yourself. Or if you use the uh, fingerprint um, feature on your phone, and when you're first setting up the phone or your laptop, it says, hey, put your finger on uh, the, the sensor and make sure that, you know, you lift it up, put it back down, lift it up, put it back down. It's trying to get a lot of different variations and different uh, capturings of that data so that it can learn, you know, because you don't want to like, uh, you know, you know, Lord forbid something happens and you, you cut your finger and that changes the way your finger shape look on your um, fingerprint. But if it has, if the model has done a good job at creating a lot of that data, it already knows, you know, how to do that. And so, it already knows how to navigate around those slight variations in your finger if you cut your finger or if you have some grease on your, your finger or your hands or something like that. And so it, again, AI is all around us. Uh, speech recognition, um, if you use Siri, if you use Alexa, if you use Google, um, it's all around. I mean, there's so many applications out there, um, you know, that you would be surprised. Recommendations of songs. A lot of us listen to music now, you know, uh, and they're trying to understand, okay, what kind of music do you like? Um, if you use Spotify, if you use Pandora, um, 
Apple Music, Amazon Music, Google Music. Uh, and so again, it's, it's just a matter of trying to find that pat the patterns in that data, um, which data is all around us. You know, you have lots of it. And so we use it every day, every, every day. All right. Uh, someone asked, will AI eventually allow robots to become smarter than humans, or will humans always be necessary, a necessary component to computer learning? So I, I believe that the technology only does what you tell it to do. Now, sometimes we tell the technology to do things that we don't, we're not aware that we told it to do. So in that respect, I believe anything that is man-made um, has opportunity for error um, and biases. And so will a robot ever take over uh, a human? I mean, there, there have been cases where that has been, that has happened, um, you know, accidents and uh, things where, you know, very strong robotic arms, um, you know, there's a glitch in the system. And again, this all goes back, a lot of this just goes back to proper testing, adequate testing, and a lot of different types of scenarios and environments. A lot of times what you'll see um, with, with some of the past case studies is that people are quick. Uh, these, these people who own these businesses, people who own uh, this software are quick to go to market. They're quick to sell the technology sometimes, only having tested it on a very small set of data or, or applied it to a very small uh, use case. Um, but it really saves you a lot of time, you know, in terms of security to make sure that, you know, people who develop the technology are thinking outside the box. You're also relying on other people in focus groups and other stakeholders to make sure you haven't missed any blind spots um, so that we don't have the cases where, you know, robots take over. But um, does it happen? Yes, it happens because there is always uh, room for error. Okay, thank you. Did Google Quick Draw sell the drawing data to Misfire? So no. So the Google Quick Draw data set is, is what we call an open source data set. Open source means that it's freely available for all, which means that they're, they're not going to sell it. Um, hopefully no one else is taking it and selling it, but that's another story. But Google themselves has, has deemed this as an open source uh, data set. So what you can do is you can Go online if you're interested in, uh, you know, finding some tutorials about data sets or for artificial intelligence, you can Google open source data, open source software, uh, open source data sets, and it'll show you lots of examples. Like, for example, the COVID-19 uh, data from the CDC is uh, open source data because everybody needs to know and be aware of, okay, what are the numbers looking like today in, in this state, in this city um, versus this city? And, and over time, what, are the, what does the data look like? And so all that is open source data that you can use to uh, you know, create your own applications. And so maybe we can uh, track people, uh, you know, we can track the numbers over time for, uh, for your city, for example. If you haven't seen your city being broadcast on the news, maybe you live in a smaller town, that data is open source and you can use it just like the, um, the quick draw uh, data. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we have, and I think you've kind of alluded to this already, um, what are some apps that we use as consumers that involve artificial intelligence? Uh, apps, so there's there's a lot of apps. Um, so I mentioned all the voice, voice ones. Um, there's also, you know, apps that are embedded in your computer. Um, I like to use the face app example, uh, you know, they're, the, the app that you, you use, you take a picture of your face and it tries to show you what you will look like if, you know, 20 years from now, I'm much older. I don't recommend using it uh, if you, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not advertising for it. Um, there's been a lot of controversy around what they actually do with the data um, and, and their agreement before you use it. But um, that is an example of a type of app. Um, a lot of you have probably seen a lot of the deep fakes um, on social media. So for example, that's, or even on, on the, uh, you know, on YouTube or on, uh, you know, different uh, news shows and things like that, TV shows. Uh, what that is, is taking uh, someone's face, for example, taking my face and what I'm saying and transferring it over to someone else's face, such as uh, Michelle Obama, for example. And so if I were to create a deep fake, I, I could be sitting here looking like Michelle Obama, sounding like Michelle Obama, my, my 
hand gestures and my mouth moving like you know Michelle Obama and you wouldn't know the difference um, and that's what we call deep fake so again that's another application of AI there are apps out there that you can play around with that um, again I don't want to scare anybody but but this is the reality of, of the, the, um, the powerful uh, uses and the, the powerful ways of the technology because um, you know it's gotten so much better over the years now to where we can have apps like this to play around with and to explore and again our our mission and our goal and i think the mission and goal of aiforall.org is to make sure that people have access and they're aware of this technology so that you can look out for it you know maybe um you can use it in your business or maybe you can use it to help your um uh, improve your financial situation or just become more interested in tech in general, uh, maybe you'll have the next big startup idea if you know that this technology exists and maybe it can solve some problems that you have. But in, a, in the same uh, voice, we want to make sure that you're aware of the technology to make sure you're not being taken advantage of. And so, uh, yes, there are lots of apps that exist and make the technology really accessible uh, nowadays. We just got to make sure that we're using it for the right reasons. Well, not just accessible, but I think convenient too. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I'm checking out sometimes and I have to just do my face ID to unlock a certain app to allow for me to purchase through my phone, it just, it, it offers me a convenience. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, another question, and this is my question. I remember years ago, people said that we would get to the point where there'll be a chip inserted in our finger or some sort to check out at the grocery store or, you know, at the gas pump. And I thought that was so far-fetched. Given that we're in COVID-19 era and everyone is wanting to become so contactless and make it so convenient for us um, to check out or do certain things where they don't have to necessarily touch me and I don't have to touch them, do you think that that will be a lot soon, something that we'll see a lot sooner? Um, or do you think that was just something in a movie and made up and far-fetched? Well, well, I mean, it's definitely available now. Like there are definitely people who choose to have this chip. I think it, it more, was more prominently available for pets, like for dogs and cats. And, you know, people who have that done at, at PetSmart actually, um, you know, at the at the Banfield Hospital, they can do that for you, um, and other uh, other vets out there. Um, but there there are people who have the chip um, in their hands, and they're able to do things like you know check out, like you said, at the grocery store. Um, I will not be getting any chips in my hand, uh, but there are people out there who do it, and and that is more so. Uh, I guess that's more so along the lines of of automation. Um, rather than artificial intelligence, but I'm I'm pretty sure it's only a matter of time before people start using that type of data as well to to do different things and create different products for it. Wow, that's almost scary. Um, there's a question on here that says you mentioned a face app and deep fake. Should we be concerned about TikTok too? So that's a that's a good question. A lot of a lot of. Uh, TikTok has been in the news a lot lately. So there's a uh, rumors or maybe even it's been confirmed that Microsoft is is trying to buy and purchase TikTok. Um, I think the platform is 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 really cool. It's really um, you know, it's another it's another wave in social media. People didn't like Facebook when it first came out. People didn't like Instagram, you know, especially, you know, I'm I'm an introvert so I I don't really care for a lot of the social media platforms. I think the biggest issue with TikTok is the privacy and the security. Um, I think it really boils down to uh, if you actually, I know we, we never read those agreements that we agree to when we use these apps and things, but um, if you actually look at that, and there's, there's several articles that talk about the TikTok agreement, the user agreement, um, it actually says that they have access to everything on your copy and paste, uh, your copy paste clipboard. So if you're like, uh, copying any, any text or any personal data like your text messages and pasting it somewhere, um, TikTok basically has access to that. And so I would I would wonder, okay, you know, some some things I understand apps have to have access to, like your camera, uh, if they're wanting to like, you know, do something like record a video, obviously they need control of your camera. Um, but the biggest controversy around TikTok is that, um, you know, there's a, allegations that the Chinese government is, you know, getting a deeper 
uh, a look into your personal life, you know, if they have access to your, your clipboard and things that you're copying and pasting. And so uh, given that a lot of the government agencies have already banned it from their phones, um, uh, other uh, big corporations have banned it from their employees um, and using it in the workplace. And so uh, we'll see what happens with the TikTok. I think um, some people are just kind of against it in general because they don't like the platform. Um, but we'll see if, if Microsoft comes in, um, that could be a, a, chain, a game changer for, for the TikTok folks. Okay. Uh, yeah, TikTok has been in the news a lot lately. And uh, if Microsoft purchases it, I wonder if that agreement will possibly change or will it continue to be the same? Um, we have one more question. I think we're getting close to the one thirty time. This okay. question is, can medical doctors use AI and machine learning for medical diagnosis to help their patients? And do you think there is enough data out there today to, for them to make a wise summation? Uh, so yes and no. Yes and no. So there are already uh, some applications out there that comb through various types of symptoms, um, and they try to understand, you know, basically taking these symptoms from previously diagnosed patients. Um, of course, there's a lot of HIPAA compliance that has to go on there and privacy and ensuring that the data is not personally identifiable. But assuming that all that is, is, is good to go and that people are not misusing the data, then yeah, there's some very powerful applications that exist. Um, now, I would venture to say that these applications probably don't have a very well diverse data set that they're pulling from, which makes it really tricky, especially in terms of health in the medical field, because, you know, if you're going to use a tool that says, okay, if, if my eye hurts and my back hurt and my, my pinky, my pinky hurts, then this means that I have this particular, you know, disease or should have this particular diagnosis. Um, when I haven't sampled a, a wide variety of people, and like I say, in terms of age groups, ethnicity, um, different types of background, different regions, different education levels, um, different prior health history and family health history. Um, for a wide variety of people, it's often said that uh, for a lot of uh, underprivileged and, and uh, people who live in poverty situations, um, a lot of people of color, um, people who live in the South, for example, lower income areas, it's often said that, uh, you know, these types of data sets do not necessarily cater or speak or represent these type of people. And so I would be, that's, that's just the ongoing problem. And, and the question is, okay, should you give your data to these efforts um, or should you not? And, and, you know, of course only you can answer that, but I want you to be informed. Um, and I personally would like to see a platform that will um, adequately uh, compensate an individual for their data um, and not just like paying, giving you a $5 gift card, but I mean, over time, if, if I'm going to give you my data and you're going to make money off of my data, then give me some equity in what you're making so that I can get a, almost like royalty payments. If my data is going to be used over and over again, I should see some benefit from it. And so ideally, that's what I would like to see and, and be implemented. I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of people working on that as well. So. Now, that you bring up is a very good point and a great suggestion. So is that something that can be handled through policy or how would companies uh, be forced to provide that type of uh, reimbursement, I guess, of some sort to people who allow them to use their data? Yeah, so it, that's, that's a million dollar question. So we have to Probably have another session for that, but, but yeah, it takes a lot of different stakeholders, um, and the solution we have not figured it out yet. Okay, well, we have reached the one thirty mark, and uh, that wraps up today's feature presentation. Was there anything else you would like to add as we close out? Yeah, so definitely uh, follow us on social media at the Bean Path, um, Facebook, Instagram. We're also on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, we also have a store. I want to say, uh, so I actually got this shirt, The Bean Path made a techie out of me. Uh, feel free to check out our store on our website, thebeanpath.org for more gear, get your Bean Path gear. And then lastly, sign up for our one-on-one -on -one tech office hours. We'll be doing that for the next two hours. We have a lot of volunteers waiting to talk to you. And uh, we have people who have already signed up, so that's great. Um, and if you can't make it this time, we'll be doing this every month. Uh, we'll also be adding uh, another 
other Saturday as well. So definitely check us out. Stay connected. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. I look forward to seeing you next time. Well, before we go, there was one other thing that you didn't mention was our YouTube channel. So people can go and view our past uh, virtual tech office hours. I believe the first one was in April. So April, May, June, July, and even this one on our YouTube subscribe to our YouTube channel and watch it there as well. Absolutely. Thanks everybody. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.